Thomas Jefferson, one of America's founding fathers, came up with the first swiveling mechanism for office chairs. Decades later, Charles Darwin added small wheels called casters to his chair to roll it around the study as he worked on the theory of evolution. Today, office chairs still swivel and roll. The office chair has become a status symbol. Executive versions have kingly dimensions. They're extremely plush and have serious lumbar support. Using a hydraulically powered machine, a worker bends 14 gauge steel tubing to form the bottom cushion frame. He joins the ends and welds steel bars to the middle. The bars will support the mechanism for adjusting the position of the seat. He hooks S-shaped steel springs from the front to the back of the seat frame. These sinuous springs will eventually provide a flexible web of suspension in the seat. He positions the rods laterally and clips them to the springs for additional stability and support. The office chair seat frame is now complete. Next, a worker builds the chair's back frame. The frame includes a spine lumbar support, armrest attachments, and other parts. He grinds burrs and other rough spots from the steel. In the upholstery department, another worker smooths the leather hide so that it sits evenly on the cutting table. He cuts out the patterns following cardboard templates. As he cuts, he works around the natural flaws in the hide, making calculated decisions to minimize waste. By cutting carefully, he'll be able to get all the leather he needs for one chair from this large hide. That's important because color and grain can vary from hide to hide. Using pieces from the same one will give the chair a consistent look and texture. Once all the leather pattern pieces have been accumulated, another worker cuts foam cushioning for backing. The density of the foam in the chair varies. He uses more rigid foam for the chair's contoured cushioning so it will hold its shape. Another worker selects softer foam for the part of the chair that the occupant's back will rest against. He cuts slits into this softer back padding. This creates channels that will ultimately become a design feature. Using chalk, he draws lines onto the corresponding leather that match up with the slits in the foam. A worker aligns the chalk lines in the leather with the slits and puckers the leather as he sews the backing to it. This forms a rib pattern in the upper half of the chair upholstery. He stitches the padding flat to many of the other pattern pieces. This particular part is a side panel for the back of the chair. Returning to the upholstery with the ribbing now, he sews contoured casings to each side. To complete the back of the chair, workers add a chipboard panel and encase the structure with foam, then cover it with the leather upholstery. Once the chair seat has been upholstered, an employee installs a plastic cover to enclose the back. He screws a sliding plate to the base. This mechanism will work in conjunction with the plate to slide the seat forward and backward depending on legroom needs. It also has features for adjusting the tilt and height of the seat. The hydraulic cylinder for adjusting the seat height is next. The cylinder also doubles as the chair stem and it swivels to allow the seat to rotate 360 degrees. He attaches the aluminum base to the cylinder. He snaps the casters into slots in the aluminum base. He equips the back of the office chair with an automobile-style headrest. The prongs fit into the brackets in the chair frame. Finally, he locks the armrests into the frame. This office chair is now ready to make someone's desk job a lot more comfortable. Vino brew is just what the name implies. Vino meaning wine and brew referring to beer. 
This hybrid beverage is part of a fledgling trend by some adventurous breweries and wineries to merge their two otherwise separate worlds of alcohol and create a unique drink. This vino brew is made from port-style sweet wine, dark, strong beer known as stout, and another ingredient that's brewed, coffee. This concoction is the collaborative creation of a winery, microbrewery, and coffee producer. The microbrewery grows some 20 different varieties of hop plants, whose flowers contain the resins and essential oils that give beer its bitter and aromatic characteristics. To begin the beer making process, the brewmaster fills a tank, called a mash tune, with water, then ignites a burner. When the water heats to around 150 degrees Fahrenheit, he pours in a blend of different types of malts. Malts are cereal grains such as barley or corn, which have been soaked to kickstart germination. Then, once sprouted, dried with hot air to halt germination. Stirring the malt into the hot water activates enzymes that convert the starches in the grain into fermentable sugars. After an hour or so, he transfers just the liquid called wort to the boil kettle and gradually adds different varieties of hops. He brings the wort to a boil to kill off bacteria and sterilize it. Next, he cools the wort and transfers it to the fermentation tank. Then he adds yeast. Over the next 10 to 14 days, the yeast consumes the fermentable sugars in the wort, converting them into alcohol and producing carbon dioxide gas, which creates bubbles. This process transforms the wort into beer. At the coffee company, the hot coffee beans must be cooled quickly after coming out of the roaster so that they don't overcook. This perforated cooling pan stirs the beans to help dissipate the heat. Then a commercial coffee grinder grinds the beans into coarse ground coffee. To prepare coffee for the vino brew, a worker puts grounds into a filter bag, saturates the bag with cold water, then submerges the bag in water, letting the ground soak for about 16 hours. Then he pours the coffee into a large jar. At the winery, winemakers harvest and press the grapes, add yeast and ferment them, then age the port wine for at least two years in oak barrels. To prepare to make vino brew, the winemakers test samples from different barrels for acidity and sweetness to help decide which wines to potentially use. The winemaker and the coffee maker then experiment with amounts of those wines and different cold brew coffees made from various types of beans. The brewmaster also joins in, measuring out beer. This process is as much art as science. For each batch of vino brew, the respective makers play with the selection of ingredients and with the proportions, tasting and smelling the samples to evaluate aroma, sweetness, bitterness, and acidity. What they try to create is a harmonious blend of the three elements, a new flavor without the taste of any one element dominating the others. Once they pin down the winning formula, they replicate it on a large scale for production. The winery pumps the selected wine from storage tanks into barrels for transport to the brewery. At the brewery, the brewmaster pumps the required amount of wine from those barrels into a blending tank. He pours the required amount of cold brewed coffee into the blending tank. Then he pumps the required volume of beer into the tank. Beer makes up the largest proportion of the recipe, followed by wine, then coffee. After blending the ingredients in the tank, the brewmaster pumps the vino brew into a beer keg. Then he injects carbon dioxide gas to add more carbonation. When you pour a glass of vino brew, the bubbles rise to the top, producing foam known as beer head. But while this might look and feel like regular beer, one sip tells you that vino brew is uniquely different.